Today we have heard two stories about people being called. I'd like to share another one, but not from Scripture. It's a true story. I know. I was there. It was a beautiful fall day in the Appalachians. We had gathered at a large rustic lodge for the weekend. In the main room, along one wall, was a large panoramic view of the Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Along the other was this immense fireplace constructed of river stone. In the room was a circle of 15 wooden chairs that looked like they'd been there long before Lee surrendered to Grant at nearby Appomattox. In the chairs were a couple of bishops and some of their staff, seminary faculty, clergy and laity from the Diocesan Standing Committee, and a young man who was at the end of a long road. It was supposed to be an easy interview to approve his ordination. He'd been in the top of his class academically. He was considered a leader by his peers and faculty and had completed his clinical training with high marks. But appearances are not everything. They are not always what they seem. A lay member of the standing committee asked him the first question, how do you know you are called to the ordained ministry? It shouldn't have been a trick question. He had, he had been asked it repeatedly over the last five years, but the young man had become exasperated by it, and perhaps feeling a little cocky, he replied with some cheek, I have never heard God call my name in a dream. I've never had a vision of God writing my name in the heavens. Frankly, I don't know what God thinks about my becoming a priest. And at that precise moment, his rickety chair gave way and collapsed, <laughs> landing the young man unceremoniously on the floor in a heap. No, I wasn't hurt. Just chagrined and more than a little concerned about how the committee would interpret my comeuppance, or perhaps more precisely, my downfall. Now, everyone has a calling, not just clergy. But clergy seem to be the only ones anyone asks to describe or defend what theirs is. Thirty years later, discerning my call, calling, where it comes from, or how best to follow it, has not gotten any easier with age and experience. I find myself envious of Samuel. He had four pretty definitive and repetitive occasions of being called. He also had a mentor in Eli to affirm that he wasn't just having nightmares. Philip and Nathaniel had it even easier. Jesus spoke to them personally, commanding them to follow. Yes, Nathaniel was skeptical before his encounter, but all doubt disappeared after meeting him. I can only hope it went well for Nathaniel after his precipitous love at first sight commitment to Jesus. We will never know. This is the only time he shows up in the Gospels. We never hear from him again. One of my many problems with call stories is that they make it sound like the call is a fixed point, usually at the end of the story instead of at the beginning. God called, good done and dusted. My experience is that a sense of call doesn't have a beginning and an end. Rarely does it happen in a blazing, clarifying moment. Rather, it sneaks up on us. Once aware of it, though, we never stop grappling with it. It becomes life's occupation. At its core, I've come to believe Calling is about responding to Socrates' admonition, know thyself. To know ourselves is at the heart of many faith traditions. In China, the sage Lao Tse said, he who knows others is wise. He who knows himself 
is enlightened. Rabbi Suja told his Jewish followers that on the day of judgment, he expected the following inquiry. Not, why were you not more like Moses? But instead, why were you not more like Suja? And Jesus, also according to the recently discovered Gospel of Thomas, advised his disciples that when you come to know yourselves, then you will become known and you will realize that it is you who are the children of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty. To hear and respond to a calling is the subject of many fairy tales and fables. You know the motif. A boy or girl somehow misplaces the knowledge of her true identity. The beggar turns out to be a prince. The stepchild who's been told she's plain looking is actually the most beautiful of all. Discovering who you really are, the story suggests, is like uncovering an unsuspected treasure, something you didn't know you had that bestows value and meaning on the rest of life and which you possessed all along. However, these moments of self-discovery don't mean we then live happily ever after. Sometimes the chair still collapses underneath us. Discerning and living out a call is a lifelong endeavor, made more challenging by our own evolution. Whether we want to or not, we keep changing as we discern and confront our sense of self. We keep having to ask, who are we today? Author Mary Sarton wrote of her own quest for selfhood and authenticity in her journals and her poetry. Part of one poem goes, now I become myself. It's taken time, many years and places. I have dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces. If we return to that moment when I sheepishly got off the floor, dusting off my behind, I frankly had no idea what I was getting myself into, although I'm sure I thought otherwise. I expect there is a reason why I can't recollect my thoughts at the time. My naive understanding of who I was and what I was seeking to become would be too embarrassing to recall. I had no clue where this road would take me. I could not have imagined who I am today or the price paid to be that person. I was just beginning to know myself. I still am. The only difference between me then and me now is I know it. While there were successes and achievements on that journey from then to now, it was the innumerable times I landed on my butt that were the most informative and formative. I suspect that pattern will continue. So dealing with the question of what my calling is today is no less exba exasperating than it was on that Virginia hilltop. I would often prefer to ignore or make light of the question. For if my efforts to know myself lead me to an inconvenient or even risky direction, I'd rather not know. But then it is too late. You either go down that road or you live with knowing you are not being true to yourself. Forsaking forever the opportunity to learn who you were to become.